Good evening, everybody. Uh, that's me. A great pleasure to be back here at 5 by 15. I'm always, I'm always terribly honored to be invited to be a warm-up act for, for five other performers. Um, that's me. Uh, I'm, I've just finished off as president of the Royal Statistical Society, an august body of people, started in 1834 by a group of men. And given the, uh, the, 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 the speakers coming after me, I'm still a lot more than slightly embarrassed to admit they didn't admit their first female member till 1858. Can you guess who it was? Oh, you There's the nomination paper in 1858, and in the top, someone got it, Florence Nightingale. Yeah, well done. She was the first female. And the point about Florence Nightingale, that people remember her for this sort of nursing business and, and all the lady with the lamp, the lamp. But to statisticians, she's an absolute you know, hero, heroine hero, um, because of her work on statistics. And then, particularly, she's the person who really started the idea of evidence-based policy and campaigning for changes. She was a fantastic campaigner from her room in South Modern Street. She would... Um, uh, you know, launch media campaigns, enormously influential. And if you want to hear all about this, uh, listen to this uh, video that came out just a couple of days ago, an animation, What Would Florence Nightingale Make of Big Data? Which I did with BBC Ideas. So I recommend that. It's, a good, it's, good, it's, it's quite good. Okay, the point about Florence Nightingale knew about, she loved numbers. She thought they were God's work. And she, but she knew that numbers could be manipulated. She was, a, she was fantastically um, perceptive in that, that. And she realized that numbers don't speak for themselves. They are not cold, hard facts. How you tell the story about them is, is incredibly essential, which means we've got to be cautious about believing numbers, such as that one. Do we believe that? No, we don't. Do we believe that one? No, we don't. So I'm, I'm completely unbiased. I don't believe a word that anyone tells me about numbers. Um, and I, I can change numbers. I'm, you know, one of the skills of dealing with numbers is realizing that it's the way you package them. So here's the thing. You know, whether that number's right or wrong, well, of course it's wrong, but let's, um, let's say, well, how can I make that look like a small number? Okay, two tricks. You could probably think of these. The first trick is don't do it per week, do it per day. So 50 million pounds per day. That still sounds quite a lot. So then you divide it by the number of people in the UK, 60 million, you get 80 pence. And then you convert it to something trivial, a packet of cheese and onion crisps. We send the EU a packet of cheese and onion crisps each every day, which could go to the NHS. Now, that is not going to win a campaign. So the way in which the story is told is enormously important. And this is reflected, plug, plug, in my new book, Art of Statistics. A shameless, it is so shameless, but, which came out about 10 days ago. It's very good. And there's some downstairs so you can buy. Um, and this is all about... Now, who learnt statistics at college or university? Put your hands up. Okay, keep your hands up if you actually actively enjoyed it. Yeah, there's a few. There's a, oh, great, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much for coming along. But one or two. But most people don't like it. And the way it's taught is actually very bad, I think. There's a new way of teaching statistics, which is all to do with ideas being motivated by problems. So, and that's the way the book's constructed, uh, with very little the theory being left. Well, there's almost no theory, no maths. And, for example, the sort of questions we, I, I deal with, how many sexual partners have people had? Is it worth me taking statins? Uh, yes, I think it is. Does going to university increase the risk of a brain tumor? No, it doesn't, in spite of claims. Who was the luckiest person on the Titanic? His name was Carl Dahl. Um, what is the probability that the skeleton in Lester Carpot was really Richard III? Very high, but not one. So, I, I, all those are in the book, and I've only got 15 minutes, so I can't do them. Anyway, but what, so what I'm going to do is, is pick on one story that I do illustrate, I start the book with, because I've got an involvement in Harold Shipman. I was, uh, I, I was uh, used, or used, I was consulted in the, in the inquiry, public inquiry. Now, you, some of you younger people might not remember Harold Shipman, um, because it was more than 20 years ago, and there he was, he was a, a general practitioner, and I said, I've got nothing to hide when he was arrested. Well, he did have quite a lot to hide because he had killed at least 215 of his patients, elderly patients, and probably 45 more. And these are the addresses of the people he murdered. Uh, his, his GP practice was in Market Street in Hyde, just along there. Quite an extraordinary, um, over 20 years he did this. And for the book, we've actually gone back to the database, still it's available online in the archive, 
and scrape the data for all the individuals listed. This is extraordinary. Between 22nd of January 1998 and 4th of March 1998, that's about five weeks, maybe six weeks, uh, he killed nine people in that time. So, you know, he did, there were some natural deaths, but almost all his deaths were people he had murdered just in a, just in, 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 in a few weeks. So um, what we've done is scrape those off and then you know, illustrated some of the data. So there's, there's a, it's a really complex plot, this, but just have a look at it. The red dots are women, the blue dots are men. This is the year in which he murdered people. That was the age of his victims. So that's the sort of distribution of the ages. That's the sort of distribution of the periods. And so we can immediately see certain periods. More, are there more women than men murdered? Yes, okay. Did he tend to murder older people? Did he think he changed his pattern over time? Yeah, younger people, you started murdering younger women here. Are there any odd, odd patterns in the, t in the year? Okay, there's this big gap there. Why do you think there's a gap? He wasn't ill? No. He didn't go on holiday, which someone else said. Why would you think there's a gap? He was under yes, he was working all this time in a, in a joint practice with five other GPs. And he thought that people were being suspicious. So he, he left them and set up as a single-handed general practitioner. So nobody could look at his records or anything like that. And then he really got into his stride, sadly. Okay, so all that means is that all it does is generate more questions. Well, how did he do this? How did he murder people? So the trick then is to go back and look at all the death certificates that he signed that a general practitioner did. And he looked, but also not just those, but looked at the, general, the death certificates signed by, by other local GPs and looked at the time of day at which, is, at which people died. And this, for the other GPs, is just sort of scattered uniformly. People don't die at any particular day and night. But for Shipman, that's the pattern. Now, you don't need any sophisticated statistical analysis. It's no, what's known as an intraocular uh, result. It hits you between the eyes. That is strange. All his patients die about between 2 and 3 in the afternoon. Not all, but most of his patients die between 2 and 3 in the afternoon. Why would they, and that's true, why do they die between 2 and 3 in the afternoon? Home visits. Somebody said, yes, home visits. He would go when they were on their own at home and visit them, and so I'd give you something to get more comfortable, and he'd give them a huge a diamorphine injection, and they would die very peacefully right on the spot, right in front of him. So then, it, all this does is just generate more questions, more questions. And the question that we were asked was, couldn't he have been caught earlier? And that's what the statisticians had to deal with. Couldn't he have been caught earlier? Because you know, these are people's relations who died. So could he have been caught earlier? OK, so the trick there is to say, OK, uh, if there were a monitoring system, what would we do? Well, we would look at how many patients he died, but you've got to expect some of his patients to die, some of his list to die. So you'd say, well, how many would you expect to die if he were just an average GP? And then you subtract the, uh, obser the expected from the observed, and that gives you his excess mortality. How many more deaths than if, if he were just average? And you plot that over time from 1977, and you see for women on the top and men at the bottom that after 20 years, by 1998 when he was caught, his excess mortality was about 190 fem older females and 55 older males, almost exactly the number that he was um, suspected or, 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 convi or not convicted, only convicted of 15 deaths of, of, of murdering. Um, so th but this is purely a statistical experiment. We don't know anything about identities. It's just excess mortality. So then the question is, well, when, if they're being monitored, could you have blown the whistle? Could it have been there, were there, there? Would you have to wait till there? And that's a matter of detailed statistical testing. And it's what's known as hypothesis testing. Could it have been caught earlier? When can you blow the whistle? How could you design a system? And that's the kind of stuff that people like me spend their careers doing. Because you've got to watch out. There are two possible mistakes you can make, known in the trade as type 1 and type 2 errors. The type 1 error is when you falsely accuse someone of murdering their patients. That is not a good thing to do. The type 2 error is you miss someone who is murdering their patients or who's got very high mortality. That's not very good either. So you want to make both of those very small. The chance of those two things, very small indeed. So you want to, this is known as alpha, the, ch the probability of getting a type 1 error, of false accusation. And beta is the probability of, of missing someone who's really doing something. And so you know, in our trade, we work on this kind of stuff, develop methods to do that. Particularly, you've got to be careful when you're doing lots of testing. Every year you're testing somebody. And then there's 26,000 GPs in the country. So you're t if you're testing all of them, 
You might, you've got to be careful not to be constantly blowing the whistle about all these people. It's very dangerous. Fortunately, back in 1943, this man, George Barnard, was working in the Ministry of Supply. He was actually a friend of Alan Turing, a, a pure mathematician. But the pure mathemat but the logicians tended to go to Bletchley Park, and the statisticians went to Ministry of Supply. And he developed this, this um, uh, sequential probability ratio test. It's also done in the same time as the States. He was a lovely man. He, la he later went on to write the British Standard for condoms. He was great. He was, uh, he'd been an active communist before the war, so he always had trouble getting into the States afterwards. I, I knew him. Um, the point is, when you applied this, actually this method, with a very stringent criteria, we could have blown the whistle in 1985, and after only 40 deaths, he could have been caught or identified. But no, nobody, there wasn't any blame. The, the judge decided no one was to blame because no one, this system was not in place. When it was tried out, it blew whistles on all sorts of GPs in Eastbourne because they were signing so many death certificates. So you've got to be really careful about this. It's true. It's absolutely true. Okay. Just, just to finish off then, I'd like to do an update. My last gig you know, for 5x15, I was the warm-up act for, um, for Irving Welsh, which was really cool. And um, I was talking about my new, my, book, my new book then, Sex by Numbers. That was the cover. That was going to be the cover. And then they decided that, oh, no, 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 no. It was W.H. Smith says, we're not stocking that on our shelves. <laughs> so they actually had to withdraw the cover. Yeah, that was a real shame. And, one of the stats that kept on coming up, people always ask about, is this one. This is how often do what I consider young people between 16 and 44, opposite sex couples, how often do they have sex? How many times a month? And the median, that's the one that's halfway along, um, was five in 1990, it was four in 2000, and three in 2010, a really steady decline. And if we carry that line on, there's not much going to be going on in the future. <laughs> and. Um, this is the kind of headline that that story brings about all the time. They're in the bed with the iPad or people look checking their phones. And there's quite a lot of evidence that is the case, that this you know, massive connectivity we've got is reducing intimacy to some extent. But um, I, I, when I gave a talk about this, I said, um, oh, oh, this was, uh, I, I blame the box set. Can't come to bed, dear. I'm binge watching Game of Thrones. So that got a bit of a laugh. And when I said it at the Hay Festival, and there's a, a, a journalist in the audience writing it all down. And I thought, oh, this is great. They're going to really give me good coverage. And the next day, this was the headline in the paper. <laughs> Britons are having less sex. Game of Thrones says Cambridge professor. <laughs> oh, God, this is awful. But, you know, and then it went on and said, this decline was very worrying. And um, if it continues, couples will not be having sex at all by 2030. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I did say that. Um, it was a joke. Um, but never mind, that's what reported straight. And I thought, oh, well, who cares? Well, I got quite angry, but I thought, oh, that's that. But then I didn't realize how modern media works. Once you get a story like that out, you get a Newsweek, is Game of Thrones ruining our sex lives the next day? You know, couples will stop having sex by turn. And, th and th this is my favorite. Sex will be obsolete by two thirds because of Netflix, going to one lone scientist. <laughs> For 40 years building up a career and reputation. <laughs> Down like that, yeah, yeah, and in German and uh, <laughs> Italian, what David Spielder says, you can, I'm sure you can translate that. And this hasn't finished. Two weeks ago, this video was about this on in, on French on a French website. What David Spielder said, and they, they in Spanish tweets about it. That was just March. That was last week or 26th of March. This French one is lovely. 26th of March tweet. So he's saying there's going to be no sex by two yeah, and Enjoy it while there's still time. He said. <laughs> No, no, actually, I don't think I did, <laughs> but never mind. But my, um, my faith, in, my faith in, 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 uh, in the media was restored by this journalist in Forbes magazine, who has got quite a statistical bent, because he actually, in his article, produced a graph showing the five to four by three, and the stupid extrapolation forwards. But he had, if you, I'm sure you can guess what he might have thought of, if you can extrapolate forwards, you can extrapolate backwards. And estimate <laughs> that in the ze year zero, people were having sex 200 times a month, which I think goes to show the power and art of statistics. Thank you very much indeed.